go. Very good. Um, I'm just talking about a few things. I think what's interesting is uh, today we've had a we're gonna have, we've had a, a talk by um, a man who's looking at the building through BIM, through whole building systems, now IES, and as obviously BIM is 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 is, is, is CAD oriented. Uh, we describe it very badly, but. Um, it can integrate very easily with sophisticated systems like IES, virtual environment, EDSL. Um, I'm not sure if it can integrate with Ecotech, but all of those look at modeling a building in its entirety and the whole system and the inputs and the outputs. What I'm looking at is actually Wolfie and the Bard here. Um, I'm looking at drilling down. I mean, information is only as good as what you, the outputs will only ever be as good as what you put in. And some of those, all of those tools, unless you actually look at what's actually happening in terms of the health and robustness of the wall, and unless you actually look at, let's say, the extra overheat loss, so that the, what I'm looking at is, is, is two of those tools. So I'm looking at thermal bridging, and I'm looking at hydrothermal simulation. So they will be extremely key inputs. And what I'll be showing today is that if you don't take account of some of those elements, those kind of focusing in on the building fabric and seeing what's happening there and its appropriateness, um, you're going to get information that could look fantastic and could convince the president of the UCC to do some fantastic works, but is based on some premises, some uh, understandings and some um, default values that actually don't stand up when analysed. So it's really important that we have the big picture analysis. It's also important that some of the key inputs are also correct and challenged. And that's what this is. Uh, so, Wolfie and the Bird, <laughs> how to how, how a knowledge of hydrothermal simulation and thermal bridging is needed to make better, long-lasting, energy-efficient buildings. And uh, I will explain that pun in a moment. Anyway, who we are. Um, Joseph the Architects, we're Low Energy Architects, we set up in 2003. We've been, um, what we used to do, what we still do, low energy airtight buildings, used to be an elective that uh, the industry thought of as being rather unusual and a bit foolish and now it's actually the minimum standard. In fact, minimum standard as of last week is now 60% you know, above the 2005 standard. And I don't think the industry or in this profession have any idea how difficult that is going to make new build buildings. Uh, renovation retrofit standards are also increasing at last. They didn't really increase for about a decade. They're, they're now increasing. I'm focusing mostly here on domestic buildings, but this also applies to commercial and we are going to see a continuing ramping up of minimum standards for retrofit in the next few years because by 2050 we're looking at uh, needing to achieve, uh, whether it's physically possible or not, we actually have to achieve carbon neutrality for our entire building stock. Now, if you take it that most buildings only get renovated, a building like uh, that, that building in, in, in Cork might get renovated once every 110 years, but uh, a normal house, let's say, might get renovated, serious deep renovation, if we're lucky, every 30 years. However, a kitchen could get pulled out every eight years. So, you know, 20, we're in 2011, you add on 30 years, or you add on 35 years, and we're already at 2050. So the kind of work that we're doing now, actually, of, of the buildings, I presume most people, there's a good majority of architects here, probably, I know there's people from other sectors, but the kind of work that we're asked to do, as opposed to the kind of work that a guy who pulls up in a white Nissan van outside Mrs. Johnson's house is asked to do, uh, you know, he'll be asked to do what gets the grant as the minimum, the cheapest and the least amount of thought. If we're involved as professionals, we should be looking to bring, to, to uh, evaluate the design better. We should be looking to bring the buildings that we're involved with, and I'm thinking about retrofit here, beyond the national minimum. And the government is bringing everything towards a minimum, trying to bring through its grant aid of C1. So for instance, I'm going to be showing you an example <coughs> from uh, the department of a Dublin City Council block of flats where the Department of the Environment gave Dublin City Council funding for that building only if they got the average of the buildings up to, uh, I think, C1 and nothing less than C2 and, and as many as possible as B3. So there was, that's a minimum standard where, where funding is now being applied. We as professionals should be going above that if we're looking to seriously face climate change, all those sorts of issues and carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and I think we, we don't have much options on that because I think it's it's a, a, it's, a, it's a great importance, it's very significant. Anyway, as a practice, we, we try to do that. Uh, in terms of building fabric consultancy, um, in 2009 I launched uh, the president of the RAI at the time, Sean O'Leary, and um, 
John Gormley, the minister, um, were very kind in launching for me my consultancy and we've been doing some very interesting work since. We set up the consultancy because as a practice we realised through uh, the study I've been doing, through the articles I've been writing, through contact with the government and, 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 and other agencies, that there was an incredible lack of understanding of building physics, of where we needed to go, of the standards that were needed. Um, I'll be showing you later technical guides documents that are incorrect. A, you know, no code of practice for retrofits, that will be ready next June. Um, you know, huge swathes, huge areas, I mean, it's incredible opportunities to think about, but huge areas where, as an industry, we are not ready for what we're being told to do. Um, and, and we need that, and we all need education. Every single person in this room needs education. Every member of the government and local authority needs education. The schools need root and branch reform. I mean, we, we actually need to turn on a pin. 60% increase from 2005, where 2005 for most of us is you know, not that far beyond yesterday, 60% uh, increase in minimum standards for new builds in housing uh, is, is extraordinary. It's, it's historic in terms of how we actually build, what's acceptable to, how, you know, how to build and, and what tools we use. So the consultancy was set up to support that. And then in terms of training, I'll be mentioning some courses at the end that we're going to be doing uh, in the next while. But we've taught about 19 times in this room the Designing Low Energy Domestic Refurb course that we created for the RAI, which was the first course, general low energy focused course, that the RAI has ever run. I think it's one of the first courses that isn't proprietary or based on a particular material or system either um, in that area. So that's run very well. We're running hydrothermal simulation uh, courses, which I'll be talking about, with uh, the Fraunhofer Institute of Building Physics and we were appointed earlier this year as the Irish uh, cooperation partner for the Fraunhofer Institute of Building Physics in relation to Wolfie Hydrothermal Simulation. Um, and we're also teaching thermal bridging. So we're, we're, besides other courses, besides I was in, on Friday I was teaching um, unemployed people about green skills and upskilling in, 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 the, in the cultivate building in, in downtown. So that's a little bit about who we are. We're, we're kind of, we're spread, but what we're trying to do is in everything that we're doing, enable the step change in building fabric design. Um, there you go. So the pun, thermal bridge or not thermal bridge. Uh, there you are, TV or not TV. Um, term 5.2 is what I want to look at first. It's just one particular type of thermal bridge software. It's free. Um, it does take a little bit of learning to use it. We are, we, are, we are teaching it, but I know some people who are happy finding their way around building standards and codes, etc. Uh, have been able to learn it themselves, some of the results. Um, and we're looking at the hidden, revealing the hidden impact of thermal bridging on energy efficiency. So starting off, what is thermal bridging? Very simply, it's the extra overheat loss at junctions. It's not the heat loss at the junction. I mean, if we're looking at that, where that window meets that wall, or where, the, um, where two walls meet in the corner, or all these different, they're two-dimensional junctions. The corner right up there where the wall meets the two walls, that's a three-dimensional thermal bridge. Uh, it's, so you can pick your way around the room. Um, it's the extra overheat loss. The, there's plain element heat loss from, from between that pier there, from the very corner of that window frame to the very corner of the other window frame, there is plain element heat loss, U values, the whole way across, but there's additional heat loss occurring at that junction. And this is not understood by the government. And this diagram, which I'm, you may be familiar, it's an excerpt from diagram two in TGDL. Uh, it's been there since 1997. Uh, I'm very sad to say that it's being republished again in the new TGDL, which will be the PDF of which will be out in about a week's time, and it's absolutely inaccurate. These are bigger thermal ridges than the one on the, on the left. Clearly, the one on the left has greater heat loss overall, so plain element heat loss and thermal bridging together, watts per Kelvin. The one on the left has the greatest heat loss, but if we're talking about design against thermal bridging, which is what that diagram is about, diagram two in, in, in TGDL, uh, the other two are actually greater. Your, your overall heat loss through here is reduced to slow down because of your insulation, but because you've done nothing here, and the same again here, the actual extra overheat loss increases. And the risk of condensation at that point, because this is internal insulation, is far greater here than it was there. There will be a lower surface temperature at that point than there was there, even though the overall heat loss through that wall will have been reduced. 
Now that's a very, very simple diagram, it's a very key diagram. We've all been looking at it, we're probably taught it in college, and it's been there, like I said, since 1997, and it has been wrong every single year. This was pointed out to the government in um, I know the RAI made a submission during the consultation period for TGD, TGDI 2010. Uh, we made a 16, 17 page consultation uh, report. I know the OPW made a significantly heavy one, various other bodies, and it's still there. Uh, which is disappointing if we're trying to actually advance our thinking and move forward in terms of our understanding. Uh, anyway, the point is it's commonly misunderstood and can uh, have a huge impact on the energy impact, a huge impact on the energy consumption of a building, particularly for highly insulated retrofits. That's actually, ironically, the weak point. Um, and a new build is likely to have been done better, but a, a retrofit um, can be can be very problematic, particularly if, let's say, if the outside of the building can't be touched, which is pushing you, let's say, inside. Now, term. What is term? The software. That's uh, a particular software, there's, there's plenty of others that we could mention. Antherm, um, uh, Trisco, Co Cobra, there's, there's a load of different softwares out there. Some of them are free, some of them are not. This is free and it's quite good. It's developed by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in, in, in the west coast of America. Uh, these are screen drops, obviously. It um, models steady state 2D heat transfer. So assuming one temperature on this side and one temperature on that side that aren't changing, and typically you're assuming 20 degrees inside and 0 degrees outside, what is the overall heat loss that occurs at that junction? And you model, you model the element, you model the normal wall and you model the junction and you, 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 you subtract the difference. So you're getting a sense of what's the plane element heat loss and what's the overall, what's the overall heat loss. You subtract uh, one from the other and you're ending up with the specific overall heat loss, sorry, the extra over heat loss, the thermal bridge heat loss which is watts per meter kelvin um, and you can output that then and you can also obviously change your design and improve it. It was originally designed, developed for window frames, you can model complex geometries and uh, what I'm showing you there is that's, that's obviously the physical model, you can actually see the energy flow through it in tiny little arrows which may be not so clear. Um, we're there looking at the heat flux, so that's looking at, it's, it's not a very because that's a very, very good construction detail, we're seeing very little additional heat loss. It's a slightly more orange tone in this area. Now, I'll be showing you details later where that's pink. It's, it, it, it's real radically different. Uh, but we're seeing that's about heat flux, and this is about isotherms. This is about temperature. So color here is about temperature. Colors there is about speed of movement. And it's validated to ISEN 10211. Uh, and Appendix D, if you're not familiar with it, in TGDL is a very good document and in fact it's the best part of the new improved TGDL 2010. I'm very happy with what they've done with Appendix D. I'm not so happy with other parts, but it's a very good uh, starting position to understand what is thermal imaging, what are the standards, what do I need to do. Uh, it's, uh, it used to be two pages, it's now probably about ten pages. So that's, that's basically, that's a basic introduction to therm. And here's a case study. This is a very standard uh, dormer bungalow in Dublin. It was a house in the same housing estate, that's the rear garden. Um, a house in the same housing estate was used as an example building for an agrimal certificate, uh, NSA agrimal certificate. And um, I happened to have done a survey in the same site, the same, the same housing estate. I was very unhappy with the agrimal certificate, I thought it was dreadful. It cost the um, supplier about 35,000 euros to pay for this agrimal certificate. It gave extraordinarily bad advice and of course he has to increase the cost of his product to justify this agrimal certificate. And I don't think that's a good thing, I think the government should be serving this. Um, anyway, 1960s bungalow, hollow block walls, uninsulated, etc. Now, your building was 110 years old, that building is 1960s with the same specification. No attic insulation, single glazing, solid walls. Um, but they're thinner walls, so in fact this is probably worse. The only thing this has that's better than yours is it doesn't have big bloody vents underneath the window, so it's marginally more airtight, hopefully. Uh, anyway, external wall insulation upgrade was called for, ventilation uh, systems, etc. But we, we focused on the walls. We used term to measure the energy impact of the thermal bridges, and just I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Uh, there, there's breaking the mold. Three is, is the third of a series of articles we wrote, all of which are downloadable on my website, josephandlarchitects.com. Um, and uh, 
it goes into the details and it, 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 it talks further about the thing. But it's the, what I want to get across here is the broad is the broad picture. The 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 what we're looking at here is um, if we're looking at the walls only, we're we're not focusing on the windows and floors. But we are focused, sorry, we're not focusing on the roof and the, and the walls in this, in this particular diagram. But we are focusing on the heat loss through the windows and doors, which in the three renovations, we've just assumed those windows and doors are the same. They're not changing. So in terms of watts per Kelvin, which are the units we're looking at, so we're comparing plain element heat loss, which would normally be measured in watts per meter squared Kelvin, uh, and, and, what, and, and thermal bridge, our linear thermal transmittance heat loss, which is normally watts per meter Kelvin. So watts per meter Kelvin obviously because a junction is linear and watts per meter squared because it typically is a surface. But by using watts per Kelvin, we can compare both of them on the same page, the same units. And what we're showing is that the gray area, the darker gray area which becomes striped, uh, hatched in the, in, the, in the second two, is the heat loss, the plain element heat loss through the walls in that building. Uh, so we've got the, the heat loss through the windows and doors at the bottom, the heat loss through the walls, and then at the top is the extra overheat loss occurring at all those junctions. And it includes junctions with the floor, by the way, and with the roof, and with the windows, and with the doors, etc. So you can see at 6% of extra overheat loss, uh, it's not, thermal bridging is not a significant part, it's not a particularly significant part of the overall heat loss in those walls and, and, and windows. And clearly, uh, we need to improve the plain element heat loss. Thermal bridging at this stage isn't, isn't critical, but it's, it's, it, there's a lot of heat loss otherwise. We then upgrade the walls with uh, external wall insulation to a U-value of 0.27. So very standard. This was about getting the ground. It wasn't about going super low energy. Um, and the plain element heat loss, so the dark grey area has reduced to that hatched area, the dark grey in the middle. And all, all good. And that is in, in exact agreement with that particular agrimal certificate. It meets all of the details that are shown in that search that cost all that money. And what we measured was that the thermal bridging summed together uh, for those walls increased by a huge proportion, more than three times. So the extra overheat loss increased by more than three times. Now the overall energy loss associated with the walls has clearly decreased from there to there. That's true. But this is unnecessary. And it's more result. If it was internal insulation, it would definitely result in condensation on surfaces. Because it's external insulation, it, it still remains additional heat loss, but there's less risk of condensation on the inside. There's a, there's a difference that way. A thermal bridge with internal insulation has, has two negatives. Much higher risk of condensation and the extra heat loss. External insulation, less risk of, of, of surface condensation, but still the same heat loss. If, if it's the same level, if it's the same watts per meter Kelvin, the same level of extra heat loss. And we just applied um, better details and, and re redid the calculations and we resulted in um, a level of thermal bridging which was 11% of the total here, but is also clearly less than it was at the start. And there's no reason why an agrimal certificate and the kind of guidance that we're expecting and the quality work coming from our offices shouldn't be of that kind. Uh, now, just to say that this, the, the example three there cost 4,000, but it's a particular building that was, was quoted by a particular builder, um, it cost four grand extra. Now, if you looked at the payback on that building, it was the same payback. But what happened, so, you know, basically the time, the time by which the extra money was recouped by savings in the day-to-day in the, in the, in the -day energy costs was met, it was that line crossed that line essentially. But thereafter, you were looking at being quids on. Instead of having a, a you know, sorry, I have to describe this out without a marker, but basically the, the rate of uh, energy increases after that point were dramatically flatter. So from the point of payback, it was by far a better deal, the whole, you know, thereafter. And the payback was about 15 years, which is, you don't get five year paybacks, those kind of short paybacks are very unusual in, in, in retrofit. Um, but 15, 20, 25 years is the kind of thing you, you, you do see more often. Point being, that would be more comfortable space, the temperature surfaces throughout the building will be more even, uh, like I said, less risk of condensation, and, and it's, it's a better financial decision. Now, if you break down the red areas on the left, they, 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 um, they look like this. This is, this is how each of those, that 6% over there, breaks down in terms of lintels, jams, sills, corners, etc. 
And what jumps out obviously is that in the, in the Agamon version, in version 2, the poor quality retrofit, the gables and eaves, the amount of extra overheat loss at that, those junctions is huge. So even if your budget didn't stretch to, to dealing with low thermal bridging approaches, throughout that, all, all those junctions, if you don't do something with the gables and eaves, once you know that that's the level of heat loss occurring there because of the details, and like I said, if there's more about this in the article, you'd be very, very foolish. Uh, if you had a tight budget and you had to make compromises, you should not compromise on your thermal grid junctions at those particular gables and eaves, and this makes that clear. Um, just if you look at specifically the sills, uh, you can see we've got a temperature factor, so that little thing up there is F or SI, 0.68, I'll be talking about that in a moment. We want to keep that above 0.75 to uh, minimize the, 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 the risk of condensation. What that's telling you is literally all of that original wall has a risk of condensation. It'll likely have that slightly damp feel that you sometimes feel on, in winter time on an old uninsulated wall, telling you that really the, the dew point isn't very far behind it. Um, we can see an improvement of, of the temperature factor at the sill window junction, the window board window junction up to 0.75, uh, but if we go down to the good version it's up to 0.96 which is, is fantastic. We can also see significant more banding. The temperatures in the room, the temperatures on the surfaces are, within the room are much more constant in the version 3 than in version 2. Now that was temperatures, isotherms. If we look at it, these are all the outputs from therm. If we look at, this isn't, this is also number crunching, but that, they're all graphics from, from them. Um, if we look at uh, the, 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 the heat flux, so now color represents speed of, of, of heat loss, uh, of movement, heat movement, energy movement, we can see that underneath the sill, underneath the window is, is clearly the weak point of any external wall insulation retrofit, and there's a significant increase from, let's say, somewhere around, uh, so around 6 watts per meter squared Kelvin in heat flux to, sorry, that should be watts per meter squared. That should be watts per meter squared. Um, so from about 6 watts per meter squared up to about 8. So that's a significant increase. And if you look at the last version, the, the fact that it's cold tells you, it's not, sorry, it's not cold. The fact that it's blue tells you that there's very, a very slow and very uniform movement of energy through there. So there's a clear difference between the three uh, approaches and I think this diagram here is really powerful and explains an awful lot to me and I think it's a really good one to keep in your heads. Uh, this isn't, this, this third line here isn't from Therm, it's something that took quite a bit of number crunching in our office but if you only see that once I think you don't, you don't forget it and what we're seeing is that that there, excuse me, that there represents the um, full heat loss, the yellow or mustard portion of that is the plain element heat loss the orange is the extra over heat loss. And what's, what we're doing as an industry, we're focusing so much on U value and so much, so much the plain element heat loss and the, and, and the U value that we're forgetting the fact that if we have particularly in renovation, if we do a poor quality renovation that hasn't been thought through and we don't particularly deal with this area here, you can see the difference, they're, they're very, very similar in this area. The heat loss overall does, yes, it decrease. But the notion that our, our, our heat loss now rep is represented by that mustard area and that dealing with that yellow or mustard area is enough, the plain element heat loss, is very foolish. If you don't deal with heat loss in a particular area, if you don't actually make a change, energy moves through it as it did before. But it's now hidden because if you look at deep, uh, again looking, thinking about domestic buildings, it'll tell you that you're, you, you can use a default uh, Y value, which is collecting all of the linear thermal bridges together and dividing by the meter squared of the area of that external envelope, it'll tell you that use a default value of 0.15. And that will assume a value of something like that. It'll assume that you've got thermal bridging, which is, which is similar to the original pattern, much, much smaller. And in fact, the overall heat loss hasn't changed, but our attribution, how we're able to describe it, how, how we have created codes and standards to describe one type of heat loss compared to another type of heat loss, that's what's changed. We've decided one area is you know, coloured yellow, one area is coloured orange, but the actual heat loss at that junction is still pretty much the same. It's slightly reduced, but not as much. But it's now off the page in terms of the standards that we're used to doing, used to using, and the inputs we use in software tools would allow us to put in 0.15 as a Y value, like I said, a collected thermal bridge, 
but it's not actually representing reality. And that means then that the outputs from that tool, whether it's IES, whether it's DEEP, whether it's SBEM, etc., is wrong. And, and we're, you know, yes, we've done something that's positive, but you could actually have a negative there as well. You could have more surface condensation. You could still have an energy bill that's higher than the energy bill we thought you had, or that the tool predicts that you're going to have, because you're not actually taking account of these sorts of things. So we need to integrate the whole building tools with the tools that focus down on certain areas. Now, the second case study, this is uh, Glover Court for um, Dublin City Council. Uh, now, just I suppose, uh, referring to what I just said, insulating the plane elements more, the plane element being the window, the wall, the floor, the roof, etc., uh, can lead to a significant increase in additional heat loss at junctions, I said that, um, and increased risk of surface condensation and mold growth at these junctions. So this, it, it can be quite significant. Now, if you're talking to Dublin City Council, their concern, their biggest concern is actually compensation and, and mold growth, etc. I mean, if you saw the papers recently from um, buildings in Tala, buildings in uh, Dolphin's Barn, you know, fully grown fungus in the corner of a room or, or you know, mildew on the surface or increased maintenance requirements or clients complaining of respiratory disorders, uh, these are tenants complaining of respiratory disorders, or homeowners too. Um, this, this is, these are the kind of things that can really scare people. And once they've spent the money that they can ill afford to get those energy efficiency measures taken, to them, and they still have these sorts of, they have these issues which they didn't have necessarily before, they can get extremely concerned and say, what the hell is happening to my building? Uh, I'm, I'm scared, what's going on? And in fact, what's going on is, is someone just hasn't taken account of these impacts. Uh, anyway, Dublin City Council were given 1 million euros to bring these flats to an average of B3, sorry, I thought it was C1, I thought it was C1, but it might be, it might be B3, but one, one, one or other. But they're only going to get the money if they genuinely got to that standard. So obviously DEEP was important. Um, the domestic Energy Assessment Procedure, I presume you all know what DEEP is. It's, it's a very basic government software that is, is a whole building software, but it's nothing of the complexity of IES uh, or even SBEM or, or various others, but it is actually the tool that's been used to calculate heat loss in 1.9 million buildings in this country, so it's kind of important. Uh, it does some things well and some things very badly. And then the key thing here is it allows a default, the TGDL allows a default for thermal bridging, which for retrofit buildings, particularly small retrofit buildings, can be wildly inaccurate. And, and there's no allowance for that. Anyway, DEEP can give a false estimate of heat loss uh, and surface conversation at junctions after the retrofit. Dublin City Council Commission Building Life Consultancy to assess which of various retrofit options achieves the least total energy loss, including thermal bridging, with least risk of surface condensation. So we took the existing building. They, 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 they had already made some proposals. They had options D A, A to M, so they'd already done a lot of work. And they had some architectural technologists banding out different options using DEEP. And like I said, DEEP had its default values. Uh, we brought them in a process from these to another design, and, and that's actually what's going to go ahead, a version of it. Anyway, this was a version approved by the Department of the Environment. There were figures, it was costed, it involves external wall insulation, um, no treatments to walls at the rear, so the rear would remain pretty much unchanged, our access uh, ground level. But the department, it was the lowest cost version, and the department approved that one. <laughs> now, after that, they, they, they were looking at different options, and they found that the cavities some walls that they thought were solid brick walls turned out to be cavity walls. They found that there were 50 mil cavities which they could then pump. So they were looking at options where you could see that kind of the, the, the original brick walls. This is an overcladding solu solution and you can see the original brick walls that they were pumping. Now they were also, there's a whole kind of banded effect and they're, they're, they're continuing the expression of the external framing of the, of the building. The, the framing that you saw there, those, those yellow or cream lines are actually the floor slabs I mean, and, and walls. It, it's, in terms of expressed structure, Corbusier will be proud. In terms of thermal bridging, it's an absolute disaster. Uh, so they were looking at localised over cladding, but of course that has big impacts in terms of thermal bridging. And these are just crude sketches we were using to, to estimate, to start calculating and using therm to, to estimate our overall heat loss, the real, the real heat loss and the additional heat loss. 
uh, and you can see that the overcladding example there in the middle sketch, you can see that this would get its cavities filled, uh, these areas here. You can see that that there is a classic area which is, you know, looking at, I mean, that, that's very bad plain element heat loss, that's more than just a thermal bridge, but obviously in these areas you're seeing additional heat loss there. And some of these is decorative, I mean, that's mostly decorative, it's doing very little, but it's still costing the client. Um, and what we worked with them is a version where option P, or external wall insulation uh, was used and the balconies were enclosed on the, I think it's the south side, and that creates winter gardens in, in winter time and in summer time those glaze, those glaze elements are going to be uh, able to move back uh, securely and provide, provide outside the heating season good natural ventilation as before, good daylight, all those sorts of things. But in the period where they need to, they can actually close down that. Now the other thing that that does is it means that the thermal envelope has got a lot smaller. So the thermal envelope is now on this line through the building. It's no longer that, 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 you know, etc. So uh, there's a number of benefits from this particular approach. And we, we still were faced with compromises on the courtyard side because of they had fire uh, excess, fire exit requirements in terms of widths, etc. that they didn't want to mess with. There was all sorts of compromises and things that they had to deal with. If they had a budget of two or three million, they could have added on decks, they could have added on all sorts of different things. But there were, there, there were things that were, they were up against. Like, like uh, Cork University, they couldn't do everything they wanted. Um, now, if you look at the mid-mid flat, and if you look at the mid-roof flat, they're both duplex, uh, of the building and look at the thermal bridging in, 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 those, in those units. Now, this is, I know people's eyes tend to swim when they see numbers, that's fine, just it's the broad picture we're talking about. Um, we, we, done about a, we did about 150 thermal bridge calculations across a range. We couldn't obviously cover the whole building, so we zoomed in on particular units that were representative of the best condition, the best condition in terms of plain element heat loss because there's so little thermal envelope to lose heat through. And, and something more typical that, that might have, uh, that has a bigger thermal envelope, because obviously it, it, it goes around the building. Um, we also made some brief assessments of some of the very worst units, which would be, let's say, ground floor corner uh, units, but we're just focusing on these two. Anyway, what we're looking at there is uh, the absolute energy loss, so watts per Kelvin. And I think if, if, if there was one thing I would love all architects to understand, U-value is not heat loss. If you control the U-value, you have not controlled all the heat loss. You've controlled a portion of it. And you've controlled a portion that's easy for us to measure. That's what you've done. And I know insulation suppliers would tell you that U-value is everything. It's only a portion of the thing. And as you, as you come down, as your standards rise, if you don't deal with it properly, other elements of the heat loss can actually spiral, which is what, uh, well, spiral is the wrong word, but can, it, can be significantly more. Watts per Kelvin, so that's real energy loss. And, the you know, TGDL, conservation of fuel and energy, it's about the conservation of all heat loss, conservation of watts per Kelvin. Uh, so we're comparing it across, just very, very briefly, we know that we've gone from here, where we had a U-value of maybe 2.2 for the, for the walls, down to, let's say, 0.27 here. So we know that those elements have significantly reduced. So the overall energy loss is reducing down. But what's interesting is, in some cases, the heat loss occurring at the junctions is actually going up. Um, and certainly not going down as much as we'd like. If we, um, as I said, yeah, Y values are higher than 0.15 watts per meter Kelvin. That's the default value that you're allowed to use unless you're complying with the acceptable construction details um, according to the building regulations. As you can see there, for these small buildings, because the only heat loss, I mean, if you imagine this is a mid mid apartment and that was the wall of the apartment, there's three windows in it. The only place that, that uh, heat can be lost through the building fabric is through there. It's not losing heat through the, the, the apartments above or flats above and, uh, and below to the, either side. So the square meterage, the meter squared of that unit is quite small. So it, it'll, have, it'll have a bigger impact. So the smaller the building is and the smaller the building fabric is, the more likely that 0.15 watts per square Kelvin as a default Y value is likely to be very inaccurate. And what we're seeing here is it's at 0.52 watts per square Kelvin it's more than three times, three and a half times, the default value. So the BUR for this building, even before it's actually renovated, is already quite, accurate, quite inaccurate. Um, what's interesting is after it's renovated, the, the Y value can be even greater. So there, there's an element there that that's, we're not dealing with in, 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 as, as an industry or, 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 or the regulator in terms of creating 
standards and default values that actually help us. Um, this value here, clearly 0.18, is, is the nearest to 0.15, and, and I'll explain why in a second. Uh, I've talked about the small envelope. Uh, so why values of option P are by far the best? Now the reason, just out of interest, I know this, this for people who aren't used to thinking with this, it can be quite hard to get your head around it, but the reason that this value, even though there's a larger external envelope to the midroof compartment, the reason that that has a better Y value, the sum total of all the thermal bridging is a lower figure than it is here, is because in fact we've actually been able to, it has a larger thermal envelope. So the heat loss can, uh, at the junctions can be spread over a larger figure, it can be allowed against a larger thermal envelope. And we've actually been able to improve the roof. So we improved the roof and the wall, uh, whereas in the top one there we could only improve the wall and it was a smaller thermal envelope. That's why the, that figure is, is a better figure. But you can see there's a very large variance. Now, um, I said earlier on that the rear of the building had had less done to it, much less done to it, in option P. And we were encouraging Dublin City Council to go towards an option P plus, where there was more work done at the back. And we were trying to, um, the exercise was really to working with the architect in the City Council and helping give, helping give him arguments that he could then use to uh, negotiate additional funding, uh, rather, rather like yourself, in terms of ensuring the best, most overall improvement. And what we were able to show was that if we had 16 watts per Kelvin of heat loss through that mid-mid apartment associated with thermal bridging, um, that's obviously per second, um, it's joules per second, watts, 14.2 of that was associated with the back, which it had relatively little done to it, and 1.84 was at the front where we'd done all the good work. So clearly, if we could if we could go with a P plus, which had more of the thinking and and uh, benefits and insulation measures of the front portion of the building, we would massively reduce the plain element heat loss and also the thermal bridging heat loss of that building. So yeah, so option P plus would likely provide a highly acceptable, relatively uniform thermal upgrade, and they've since made some of those changes. We actually don't have the, the drawings of the final changes that they've made and uh, I believe they're going to go on site reasonably shortly. So that, that was a whole discussion which brought them, I mean the option M that I showed you earlier on was actually I think either the chief city architect or the deputy chief architect, uh, his own version, his own approach. So we had what the Department of the Environment wanted to do and were anxious to do. We had what the, 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 the boss of that architecture department wanted to do, and we were actually able to persuade through numbers, number crunching and use of therm, uh, an approach which was neither of those, and which actually was more uh, robust and healthy. So, um, so looking now at condensation risk for the same buildings, I just said the thermal bridge analysis allows assessment of the risk of surface condensation. So if you do that thermal bridge calculation, you can use it in two ways. What's the heat loss? What's the additional heat loss? And what's the likelihood of condensation on that surface? Now, moving towards colder winters, which seems to be a pattern that was in, certainly in the talking about in the paper, we could be looking at very cold winters for the foreseeable future. I know a lot of clients, I don't know about you, who are saying to me, Joseph, I'm not going to get put on a winter like that. I have to spend the money. You know, And, and that's something we, uh, for certainly the architects present, want to hear. And, and we need to do the right job, though. So, uh, thermal bridge calculation can help you with that as well, and it's under BS 5250, which is the Code of Practice for Condensation Risk, and Appendix D of Technical Guidance like Model. The higher the temperature factor, F or SI, the better. One is, is excellent, zero is terrible, 0 0.75 is obviously there. So depending on the outside temperature and the inside temperature, what's happening at that point is indicative of whether there'll be condensation or not. Now if we look, that's a simple section through the existing building, obviously almost zero insulation. This Minimal insulation here is kind of a wood fibre or something that was used as packing at the bottom of the shuttering uh, originally, and you know it's, it, it is almost nothing. And we were proposing on the good side, the front of the building, creating the winter garden and the insulation line. So the the insulation of the of the uh, the window line, some amount of insulation here that could be better, obviously, and then continuing. So it's a fairly continuous line uh, as a as a as a retrofit. And obviously, this is still mostly decoration, but we went back to them about that. Anyway, if you looked at the temperature factors, um, you've got 0.29 on this side, you've got 0.285 over here. If we're looking for 0.75 to avoid condensation risk, we're clearly in condensation mode. There will be condensation there every winter. 
clearly running condensation, the maintenance regime for the department for Dublin City Council would be higher, the comfort level for the for the occupant would be lower. It's 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 terrible. It's 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 very, very poor. Uh, when we upgrade, we're up at 0.87 in this case, so that's a good deal above 0.75, that's very healthy. And you can see this has improved. This insulation is coloured blue, by the way, because um, in terms of temperatures, that's obviously being heated by the room and that's still outside. That insulation is having almost no thermal effect. It is, like I said, decoration. But there is some benefit occurring here, probably mostly because of that little amount just here. That's a higher figure than that, but it's still not good enough. So with option P, we could say, yes, you're going to reduce your energy loss, and yes, you're going to improve the front of the building and, and, and risk of condensation sections at the front of the building, but not at the rear. We need, we need an extra funding. We need to do this job properly and do it once. Uh, so like I said, the, the um, front of option P, condensation risk is generally close to 0.9, way above 0.75, very healthy, which is great. But even there, there's areas that we need to be careful about. And for instance, that area there, uh, where there's a, cook, uh, a walkway through to the back of the site, um, e even with the option P upgrade, there is areas that could be improved. Now, actually, it strikes me it's pretty obvious that we could improve the amount of insulation there and help that one. The 0.65 is getting closer. It's just it's not good enough, in my view. And 0.515, uh, again, we might be decreasing exit widths if we insulated a little bit there. Uh, that cavity, I think that's a cavity that was able to be filled. But those two could be improved, but for the initial measures, there was something to say. So it's, 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 it's a powerful tool, and it really changes the way you think about architectural design and, and what's acceptable or not. Now, conclusions on that section, there's one short section after that. Uh, conclusions on that, looking at U-value alone gives us false impression of the heat loss through the envelope, thermal envelope. Thermal bridging is commonly misunderstood and not properly accounted for. It can become far greater after retrofit works are carried out. The impact of thermal bridging grows almost exponentially for highly insulated buildings. Exponentially is a strong word, but it, it certainly it can grow, as you can see in the uh, diagram, if it's not taken care of. And of course, if one thermal bridge, one junction is near another junction, all these orange areas can start holding hands, and you can end up with, with a lot of heat loss that simply isn't, isn't uh, finding its way onto your SBEM page, or your IES page, or your, or your D page, etc. And there'll always be tight budgets and compromises, now more than ever. But that's why we need to know exactly how to spend the money and why. Uh, so that's, that's that. And like I said, Therm is a great tool to do that. There's other tools. Therm's free. Uh, training will be beneficial. Now, there's the woofy. <laughs> um, if the works aren't healthy, long-lasting, and durable, it wouldn't matter if the calcs show they're energy efficient. I, I don't know how many of you agree with that point, but I feel very strongly that point. If, if we're trying to encourage the market to go down a route of energy efficiency but we're not we're not actually using the wrong kind of materials or we're resulting in uh, accumulation constant accumulation of moisture let's say within the wall or, or roof etc uh, no one will thank us and in fact places like australia where they where they had a national program that people were very enthusiastically following for retrofit a few people died uh, some some building failures occurred and the entire thing ground to a halt if the public feel that insulation is going to make my Johnny sick, we can forget. And, 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 and we haven't done ourselves any favours and we've, we've wasted money. So making sure that the actual insulation and, 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 and the measures made are appropriate from a high growth thermal point of view, that's to do with vapour, moisture and temperature, is, is, is critical. And again, this is not something that's in IES, RD or SBEM. It's something that needs to be fed into it. Um, so what is Woofy Pro? I'm talking about Woofy, but there, there's other softwares as well. Another one's called Delphin, D-E-L-P-H-I-N. Another one's called HiGurk, H-Y-G-I-R-C. Woofy is, is uh, the, the, the leading software in this area, hydrothermal simulation software. That's a screen output. You can see you've got different cases that you're creating on the left-hand side. You can change thicknesses, you can change the temperature, you can change the climate, you can change, you can, you can introduce leaks, you can actually cause see what, what happens when you when you when the, 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 the render is penetrated, you can um, change the ventilation where it comes from, you can change all sorts of things. You can even put climate changed data into it. Um, anyway, it's proprietary software developed by the Fraunhofer Institute for Building Physics, costs that amount, and a trial version is freely downloadable. Uh, and, and increases in Ireland downloads in Ireland are, are increasing significantly. They're only about ten a month at the moment and, and rising. Um, 
It simulates hourly hydrothermal. It's not hydro, it's hydrothermal. So like I said, vapor, water, and heat, how all of that works together through a buildup. Woofy Pro is one dimensional. It's looking at that bit of building fabric in one line. You can also get Woofy 2D, which allows you to look at junctions, um, discontinuous constructions. And um, it allows interstitial condensation risk analysis. It's moisture dependent heat loss. I mean, heat loss is not steady. It actually depends on, on the moisture content. So, and, 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 and temperature on either side. I mean, watts per meter squared Kelvin, the U value is based on one degree of temperature difference on either side of the wall. How often does that happen? Very, very rarely. Normally we've got an awful lot more temperature difference on either side and that will change the, the rate of energy loss. Also it can be used to look at the risk of mold and freeze thaw cycles, etc. Uh, it's dramatically more accurate and powerful than the old Glazer method and it's relevant to far more issues and building types. For instance, Glazer was invented for timber frame and it's, it's, it's actually very good. It's a sim simplified, highly simplified method for assessing the timber frame, but it's been used every day of the week by uh, most installation suppliers in this country to give you advice on uh, the appropriateness of insulation upgrades to masonry buildings. And it should never have been used for that purpose. It's not meant to be. Uh, anyway, uh, hydrothermal simulation and Wolfie conform to ICN 15026. Now, just very briefly, there's just two examples of, 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 of uh, measures that as, as moisture content is increasing, the, the thermal conductivity is changing. I mean, polystyrene, in this case, is moving from somewhere around 0 0.038 watts per, meter watts per meter Kelvin up towards 0 0.078 uh, based on water content increasing. You know, thermal performance is not static. And this, I won't, this here, it's just, it's something to do with latent heat of evaporation. It's, 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 it's the material actually reducing its um, energy flow in order to help take moist, heat in energy in to dry out. But that's not important. The important thing is, we look at the aerated autoclave blocks. Quin like blocks, for instance, um, it's the reason why there's a special quin like block below the DPC line compared to above the DPC line, because water massively reduces the thermal performance. Uh, you, we need to know these things. So this is what it's about. This here is, is looking at a steady state U value and actually what's actually happening in the wall where there's transient U values. So every, oh, hello Sean, um, every, every summer as the, as the insulation material and the wall in general are drying out, the actual thermal performance is dropping. It's getting better, near, in this case near 0.12 watts per meter squared Kelvin. But as elements of that wall, driving rain, all these different things are affecting that wall every winter, the uh, thermal performance is getting poorer, the number is getting higher. So that's something that, and you can also see that cycle is increasing, so there's, there'd be a, you know, something to say that's, that's not very comfortable there, I wouldn't be happy with. But that's something, that, that, that transient U-value measurement is something that's now required by the German government. They're, not, they're no longer happy with the static U-value because they recognise it, 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 it misses too much of what's actually going on. And for instance, if, if this building, if something's beginning to go wrong here, which would indicate accumulation of moisture. Again, there's no point in having a U value that looks great in a piece of paper if it's not real. Uh, so just some of the things that you can look at with hydrothermal simulation, frost damage, rotted timber, corrosion of metal ties, um, you know, so the use of a lot of plastic ties or galve ties and walls, there's, there's, it can have an impact therefore on the engineer as well as the, uh, as the architect. Um, in poor indoor air quality can be looked at, uh, issues of of mold or moisture accumulation behind internal insulation is, is a classic. What's happening to, if that's timber, probably isn't, but let's say it's timber for the moment, if there's an awful lot of moisture accumulation here, is that actually traveling into the timber? Has it been taken in? Could that have a structural impact? A lot of things like that are, are, are of great importance. And particularly when we're dealing with old buildings that were used to being leaky, we're used to having a gale blowing through them and used to having people wearing jumpers or whatever necessary inside. You change the environment you, you, you uh, control the conditions, you increase the moisture content, the relative humidity and the temperature, uh, that can have an impact. You know, it could be okay, it might not be okay, we need to know. Now this is a particular case study, it's the, the, the last case study, for a stone walled building in Glasgow, and it's a paper where we're just in the stages of completing for Historic Scotland. Um, and that's quite an eminent body, there's some very good papers on their website. We're looking at solid stone wall building, and there's, there's an inside picture, very, very, uh, very basic. And we're looking at three different internal insulation strategies, which were physically built. Uh, they weren't all measured as well as we would like, 
but we were asked to create a paper um, based on, on reasonable assumptions of what was, what was done and using proper hydrothermal simulation and comparing it to the Glazer method, etc. So this is something I haven't actually seen often in Ireland where they've timber studs, cellulose is blown in and they must have a certain moisture content in the cellulose and there's then a, a device, I don't know if you can see it over there, it's like a little roller, it just rolls down the studs, takes off the excess, that wall is ready and then it's planted with plasterboard. That was one of the methods they used. No vapour control there, which is quite interesting. Um, you could say that that's a niche or a retrofit uh, product. It's obviously bio-based, it's, it's a natural material, it's made from, from trees, from newspapers, which were made from trees. Uh, therefore, it has hygroscopic characteristics, which are useful. It obviously has a poorer thermal performance than some. It's vapour open, like most natural building materials. Uh, it's, it does a spray application, there's no air gap, obviously. Air fills, hygroscopic, completely open. Completely open means that water moving through can actually can be transported. Capillaries are like, like straws, like tubules that can draw water in and out. So you've got vapour movement through, you've also got water movement through in most building materials. Anything that's hygroscopic can allow either. And it's the degree to how, how much is the question. So we're simulating it with and without vapour barriers because in, in this part of the world we've typically been told a vapour barrier is always necessary in good practice work. Um, here we're looking at a very innovative material um, Aerogel or Space Therm, available from Procter in, in Scotland and I think Ireland, but Aeroboard also have a, a, an equivalent product called Space Liner. And I don't know if you can see it, but that you're looking at the, the whitish material there is this, um, it's like a felt and it traps gel. And it's, 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 it's NASA technology, instead of trapping air or gas, they're trapping a gel which has fantastic conductivity, 0 0.013 typically, which is twice the performance. Of phenolic, um, and I, it, un, unlike phenolic, it's vapor permeable, and it's bonded there to um, firmicell board the, on, on the outside. So it's a bonded, it's an insulated plasterboard, but of a different insulated firmicell board, but of a different kind to the one we're used to. And it's, it's you can see the fixing methods. It's it's synthetic, but it is it is um, vapor open, fixed with battens, gel filled, hygroscopic. Capillary, there is a capillary break because of the gap, it's no vapor barrier. And then the last one, phenolic insulated plasterboard, and you can see, uh, you, you, you know what that's like yourselves, it's, it's more vapor closed, fixed abatons, <coughs> non hygroscopic, and non capillary active. Um, so they were the builders we were looking at, and we've done a significant study. Again, this is a, a very small representation of what we found, which is basically this. I'm just going to show you this one slide, this is the second last slide. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that there's a risk of mould growth according to BS5250 and also in accordance with um, ICM. Well, what ICM 15026 is slightly more modulated, but BS5250 is still broadly, broadly useful. And what we're seeing on the left hand side are the two um, vapour permeable build ups that don't have a vapour barrier. Even though one is pretty much synthetic, which is the bottom left and has a super duper performance, conductivity of the material, like I said, 0 0.013, and the one on the top left has a conductivity of maybe 0 0.044, uh, maybe 0 0.04. So, quite different in their materials. This has an air gap at the bottom, this doesn't. This was blown in, this was mechanically fixed. But what, what we realize, well, that's those on the left hand side, and the two on the right hand side, this is the same cellulose, but now there's a barrier, and the barrier is either Intello which is a very, very good vapour control barrier in timber frame and in roofs and in all sorts of applications, but actually what we've realised should not be used in dry lining single leaf walls. Uh, and then PE, which is polythene, so that's even more vapour vapor tight. And then down here, the phenolic insulated plasterboard. So the ones on the right are pretty much providing a vapour barrier. The insulated plasterboard is, is so vapour tight, it's like a vapour barrier. So the ones on the right hand side are showing a vapour barrier to the room side of the insulation, the ones on the left are more permeable to the room. And um, like I just said, no, the vapour barrier such as is a key feature of timber frame buildings where dominant moisture load is vapour from the room, and this is very important. But we've, we've found, and this agrees with what the Fraunhofer will be finding, it agrees with products being supplied by ecological building systems such as calcitherm, or by NBT such as Palodentro, or all sorts of different materials from a conservation point of view. But we've found is that this actually is also important for, for, for any single leaf uh, internal insulated building, not just those in the conservation um, area. Uh, this study seems to indicate that in single leaf masonry walls, the dominant moisture load is actually from within the masonry. 
Now this could be to do with construction moisture, it could be due with moisture because there's moisture there anyway um, from the fact that there's water and vapour movement at all times through hygroscopic building materials, but mostly the driving rain. And anything that prevents drying to both sides. So when the driving rain, you know, it's, it's, it's sunny now, it'll be raining in an hour, guaranteed. Uh, well, maybe not that blue sky. And, you know, 20 minutes later, it, 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 it could look sunny and dry again. Now, it, it could take an hour for that wall to dry on the surface, and you might say that's fine, but 20 millimetres into that wall, it could still be soaking. And that could go on, and certainly in this country, where we can have very limited periods of continuous drying, that wall there could be actually be wet in the middle of that wall for most of the year. That, that, that's, that's well possible due to driving rain. Um, the moisture that's therefore in that wall needs every chance it can to dry out. If, it does, if it's restricted on one side, it can cause a problem. And, and this is the point about all this is this is this is the kind of thing that Woofy and other hydrothermal simulation software can show you, and it can revolutionise, and it shows it needs to revolutionise our industry because again, this is the sort of thing that isn't included in those normal tools that we use. Um, higher insulation values and higher room moisture levels also stress the conditions within the wall, as was shown in breaking the mold four and five. This this article, this this paper from the SARS that we have that will be downloadable hopefully in July from the Star Southern, will broadly take the place of those articles that we wrote before, which were all about what the hell do you do with retrofitting single leaf walls. Um, and final thing, we need to control driving rain, but encourage driving, encourage drying. This is the key to a robust, long-lasting, energy-efficient retrofit of walls of these kind of buildings. Now that's uh, the last slide there to other than saying thank you. Uh, just to say, we're running designing, this is a shameless plug, we're running designing the Energy Domestic Refurb course tomorrow here, and there'll be other ones going on. The next course, which is called Detailing and Best Practice, because an awful lot of people felt they wanted more solutions, they wanted more grit, more technical details, they wanted us to do the work for them, all that sort of thing. That will be coming up uh, in the autumn, and that will be following, that's about how do you comply with Part L, the new Part L, which will be difficult, but also what's a really good practice detail, how do you deal with different things. Um, that, that's, watch this space, it, it'll be part of the RAI sustainability, series of sustainability courses, RAI does detail and best practice. We're running a thermal bridge course on the 22nd to 23rd of August, and that, using Therm, showing you the free software, and Woofy, the hydrothermal simulation software, will be running a course with the Fraunhofer in Dublin on the 15th and 16th of September. Um, and there are opportunities as a consultant there, if you're tired of practicing, for those who are architects, if you're talking about practicing as an architect, uh, there's, it's, it, it's a definitely a growing area of the industry that needs to be, because we only get one shot at renovating our building stock in this country. Thank you.